Thank you very much for the introduction. So this is a joint work with uh, Ting Wei Meng and Gabriel Covache uh, Langlois. Okay. So we saw in the tutorial day at uh, IPAM and doing this workshop uh, on optimal control and, um, and games that we need to solve Hamilton Jacobi equations uh, that are written here in this form in many high dimensions, when n is the dimensions, where generally we could have a Hamiltonian that depends on the momentum, the gradient of the solution, with respect to the space variable, with the dependence in x and t, and potentially a second order term. And we are also given an initial data, j. So the main goal of what we want to achieve is to compute a viscosity solution of this guy given x and t when x lives in Rn and t is a non-negative number. So the main goal is not only to evaluate the value function s at x and t, but also its gradient with respect to space because it has important application for control. You need this guy to be able to compute the control. So of course we want to do that in very high dimension, if possible. And it's also obvious that we want to compute that in a very fast way and potentially in a real time way. The main constraint that we may have depending on the application is that we are only allowed to use very low memory, low energy, and especially for embedded system. So there are many approaches to solve uh, this problem, and perhaps uh, the most uh, developed ones are grid-based, for which uh, sophisticated numerical schemes has been developed, such as Eno, Wendo, discontinuous uh, Galenkin method, and it's very well understood and very powerful. The main drawback, as we may know, is that it does not scale well when the number, when the dimension n is increasing. Because uh, of the discretization, we need a memory that is exponential with respect to the number of dimension. So, it's saying, uh, it's, so in practice, it means that if the dimension is too big, so here I put four, but maybe using sparse grid, you can go to eight or 10. If you are above such a number, then you cannot, in practice, compute or evaluate those solutions because you do not have memory to store the solution. There have been many approaches to overcome or, or to mitigate the curse of dimensionality when n, the dimension, is very big. I only here mention some um, themes that have been developed in the literature for many years to overcome or mitigate the curse of dimensionality. It is by no way comprehensive. And uh, since there are many people, I only, only mention um, some names. So one of the approach is based on the Max Plus uh, approach. I'm sure Mayan, uh, Akion, and uh, Mac will talk about it. There are other approaches based on uh, tensor decomposition, or sparse grid, or model other re um, reduction, optimization techniques, and so on and so on. Whoops, I'm sorry. So more recently, there was a trend in using machine learning techniques and neural network techniques to solve uh, PDEs. So not only Hamilton Jacobi PDEs, but uh, general PDEs in general. And we saw some talk related to that in this workshop. One of the main theorems that is used for this work in solving PDEs is to leverage universal approximation theorems. Roughly speaking, it says that if you give me a big enough neural network and a function that lives in a nice uh, functional space, then uh, your neural network can approximate this function as close as you want. So there are some pros and cons when you are using a neural network for trying to approximate to actually represent solution of a PDEs. One of the, uh, one of the problems or questions, I would say, is that it's in general, it is hard to interpret what the neural network is uh, doing. That leads also to problems about the generalization uh, of the network 
and eventually uh, there are or there may be some problem in reproducing the results. So these questions are well known and many people are working on it and provide partial answer, but those are the main challenges in using a neural network. On the opposite side, from a very practical point of view, there is a huge computational advantage that will go far beyond uh, the current um, computational resources um, that are available today. I'm thinking about CPUs or GPUs. Namely, it's uh, the fact that many companies are developing dedicated silicon design to implement those neural nets. So the evaluation of the neural nets will not be done on a GPU or on a CPU, but it is uh, done on a dedicated uh, chips that uh, will be extremely fast and will use very little energy. So those dedicated hardware are essentially based on what we call FPGA. This is the acronym for Field Pro Programmable um, Array. And um, the main companies um, that have been develop develop developing that is called um, Xilinx. So they started essentially in the uh, 80s. And Intel, a few years ago, bought uh, the competitor of Xilinx for about uh, $15 billion. So the idea is to combine those new silicon design with the current technological uh, chips. And as I mentioned, there are many startups that are developing uh, chips for implementing neural network. The main advantage of getting uh, those chips is that you can uh, get a more precise control of what we mean by fast. So by fast, there are essentially two notions. One is called the throughput. The throughput is how much a uh, result or evaluation of the PDE you can provide per unit of time. The latency is how much unit of time you need to wait before getting the answer. So depending on the application, you want to maximize the throughput or you want to maximize the latency. A typical example is about a real-time um, optimal control where you want the latency to be extremely small. But uh, there is a trade-off, generally. If you want a small latency, then you will uh, have a small throughput. On the opposite, if uh, you, can, uh, you want to do computations offline, then you don't really care about the latency, so you can wait a rather long time to start uh, producing the first result, and then you have very high throughput. So those chips allows you to, um, to design algorithms for evaluating neural networks where you choose the throughput of the latency. One of the key things is that those uh, chips are very efficient in terms of energy. You only need a few watts to evaluate those neural network compared to most probably hundreds of watts if you are using a CPU or GPU. And I'd like to mention that those chips are used not only for embedded computing, for instance, you have the, those chips in your phone, but also you can use FPGA, for instance, in Amazon to do those computations. So one of the main questions here is, can we leverage these computational resources for computing solutions for high dimensional Hamilton Jacobi PDEs? So a related question is, can we mathematically certify that certain neural network actually computes viscosity solution of certain hamilton jacobi equations? So the main goal here is to not solve for all possible hamilton jacobi PDs where the Hamiltonian is given and the initial is given. It's more about trying to exhibit architectures that will define Hamiltonians and initial data and uh, for which we will know that the neural network computes a viscosity solution. So, the way uh, we, uh, what we wish to accomplish is to design those architectures that corresponds to representation formulas of solution of Hamilton Jacobi PDEs. If this is doable, then it says that some of the physics of the problem can be actually naturally encoded into the neural network architecture. 
And we shall see that this is possible for certain Hamilton Jacobi uh, PDEs for Hamiltonians and uh, initial data that take particular forms. And we shall see that the parameters of the neural network will define Hamiltonians and the initial data. Now, on the, on the upshot in that since we will be able to design some neural network architecture without any approximation of the solution, we will get exact solution of, of the solution at xt and also the gradient. So the, with this map between neural network architecture and solution of hamilton jacobi PDEs, it may help to provide an interpretation of some neural network architectures of, so, of I would say, some building blocks of those neural nets and to understand or to interpret what those building blocks of neural network are doing. I'd like to mention here that um, the results that uh, Ting Wei and Gabriel and I did do not rely on universal approximation theorems. We should for exact representation of the solutions for certain hamilton jacobi PDEs when the Hamiltonian and the initial data will be given by the parameters of the network. So the outline of my talk is as follows. I uh, will talk first about a shallow neural network architecture that can represent uh, viscosity solution of certain Hamilton Jacobi PDEs. It is um, these architectures uh, are inspired by the UF representation formula. So this is what I will talk about first. Then we will see that we can develop variations of this architecture to cope with uh, 1D conservation law, and then we can also extend it to deal with um, a class of a viscous Hamilton Jacobi PDE. So the second part of the talk, where I will briefly mention uh, other kind of neural networks based on different representation formula, namely the lax onenic formula, and then finally I will draw some conclusions. Okay, so let's start with a neural network that is depicted here. This is what we call a shallow neural network because I have only one layer. X and T are the input of my neural network. So X lives in Rn and T is a non-negative number. Then I uh, take these values and I feed here M neurons. And the neurons here corresponds to doing uh, a scalar product between the vector XT with some parameters pi and theta i and adding a bias. So this seems the usual affine uh, layer where you take the input and then you apply uh, an affine combination of your input. And the, each neurons output the result by the scalar product and um, the bias. Then once you have all those guys, you collect them by uh, what we call in neural network architecture, a max pooling. In other words, you have the output of all your neurons and you select the maximum. And you call that real number that you get f of x. So the architecture of this neural network is a fully connected layer followed by an activation for a function that is called a max pooling. In practice, once you have this uh, architecture, you define a function f from Rn, x lives in Rn, t is a non-negative number, and you associate a new one num uh, uh, number, and uh, it is defined as follows. It's the maximum of the scalar product between x and t with your parameters pi and theta i, uh, minus a bias that we call gamma i. Now, the main question is as follows. Can we find conditions on the parameters? So pi, theta i, and gamma i, such that f actually satisfies a PDE, and we also want to know which kind of PDE. 
So to do, uh, to be able to answer this question, we need some assumptions on the parameters. So here, first I recall what the neural network uh, does in terms of a function. So we are considering these functions with the parameters pi, theta, and gamma i, and we have m neurons. So we have three assumptions, and A1 and A3 are technical assumptions. So first, we say that the parameters pi has to be different from each other. This is a technical assumption uh, that can be easily removed in practice, but uh, when we put it, it simplifies the analysis. Then the assumption A2 is a very strong assumption. We need to assume that there exists a convex function, g, from rn into r, such that every time I evaluate my function g at the parameters pi, it gives me back the other parameter gamma i. So I need to have a very strong assumption on the connection between those guys, pi and gamma i. It is done through the existence of a convex function j that satisfies this equality. And A3 is also a technical condition which essentially says that when I go back to this architecture, all neurons contribute to the definition of F. So this is, again, only a technical assumption that simplifies the analysis, but it's not um, important for application. So I insist, A1 and A3 are only technical uh, assumptions. Oh. Hey, Levon, uh, sorry. I mean, hey, uh, Jerome, we have a question by Levon. Ah, yes, Please, uh, sure. Please, Levon. Uh, so, Jerome, so uh, maybe this is still a question, but uh, is A2, will, will A2 be equivalent if instead of convex, we just say uh, uh, le uh, piecewise linear or something like that? Uh, yes, then we will see that uh, that guy... The equivalent, right? Yeah. Well, the equivalent... <laughs> But uh, just uh, okay, uh, yeah. Does it? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, ba, ba, ba. all right. So I insist that guy is uh, crucial. This is um, the restriction that we have. So once you have this assumption and that neural network then the initial data is naturally defined by looking at your neural network when t equals zero, and that tells you that the initial data must, be, uh, must take this form. It's simply by looking at the definition of the function and you put t equals zero. So then, as you mentioned, j uh, is uh, convex. We can compute analytically in the Fenchel transform of this guy, and it reads as follows. So it's in the minimum of um, the simplex uh, of some parameters of um, the simplex of uh, linear terms. And if you look at the set of minimizers that achieves this minimum, then uh, you can call that guy uh, A of P then you use this set to define a Hamiltonian that will read as follows. So once you have the parameters pi, theta, and gamma i, you define, I mean, those guys define an initial data, and uh, it also defines a Hamiltonian. And the hope is that F will be um, the viscosity solution for the Hamilton-Jacobi PDE when the initial data is given by this guy and the, Hamilton, and the Hamiltonian is given by this guy here. And this is actually what we have in the following theorem. So we assume that we have the three assumptions, um, the three assumptions hold, and then the neural network that was defined, as well as the initial data and the Hamiltonian defined by the parameters of the neural network, then uh, we get that F is actually the unique uniformly continuous solution to the following hamilton jacobi PD. So F is exactly uh, given by the evaluation of the neural network, and H and J were given by the parameters of the neural network. And you can also show that F is actually jointly uh, convex in X and T. Now, 
it is what we have is that F is the unique uniformly continuous viscosity solution for these guys, but actually F is also the unique uh, uniformly continuous viscosity solution for other kind of, I mean, for other Hamilton Jacobi PDEs. So you give me exactly the same initial data, J, but now H tilde agrees with H for all the parameters PI. So every time uh, you give me a PI, evaluate H, then H tilde must have, uh, must take the same value on the same points. But uh, H tilde can be above H. So in other words, it's saying that the neural network computes solution of, uh, I mean, uh, actually the uh, viscosity solution of not one Hamilton Jacobi PDE, but actually an infinite number of Hamilton Jacobi PDE, and you have a freedom in choosing uh, H. Now, among all possible H, you can talk about the minimal one that uh, we call here H. So this is a summary of what we have so far. You give me a neural network architecture as follows. It defines the function F. Then uh, we have shown that F computes a viscosity solution for the Hamiltonian and the initial data that are given by the parameters of the network. And we have seen that the Hamiltonians are not necessarily unique. But among all possible Hamiltonians, then we can select the smallest possible one. And we also have that when S is differentiable at XT, then uh, the special gradient with respect to X is actually uh, the game that maximizes, that realizes the maximum in the max pooling operation. So here I just uh, give you briefly so, an example of an initial data and uh, a Hamiltonian that can be represented with uh, this uh, neural network. I don't want to go into the details, but um, you can identify for certain initial data and certain Hamiltonian parameters of the neural network so that you will satisfy uh, so then the neural network will uh, give you the viscosity solution. Here, this is another example where I give you this uh, initial data and this Hamiltonian, and you can uh, design the parameters of the neural network so that the neural network will compute the viscosity solution for this hamilton jacobi PD, where the initial data is given here, and the Hamiltonian is L1. So to implement this guy, this is only a few lines in TensorFlow or in um, PyTorch. Essentially, it's about uh, 15 lines. And then you can uh, visualize uh, the solution uh, by running the neural network. So here I took um, the previous example, n is eight, and I represent a 2D slice of the solution uh, for the two first variable, x1 and x2. And then you see the evolution of those guys when times evolve. So as I mentioned before, we can, um, we saw that when we consider the elements of the neuron that realizes the maximum in the max pooling, it gives you on the gradient. So here we just take the same architecture, but we replace the max pooling by considering the uh, neuron that realizes the maximum. And so every time you give me XT now, then I'm going to consider the special gradient of F with respect uh, to X. So this neural network essentially intends to compute the special gradient of the solution of the hamilton jacobi PDE. So the special gradient actually will give you the considered momentum. So mathematically, you define a map that takes x and t and gives you back the gradient in Rn. And it's defined as follows. Okay. So what do we get? 
is specific for the dimension one, because those guys will relate to 1D conservation laws. So we assume here that the dimension is one. We also assume that the previous assumptions, A1, N2, and A3, hold. Then the map defined by the neural network actually will compute the entropy solution to the following Hamilton Jacobi, uh, uh, to the following uh, conservation law. So you take your Hamilton Jacobi and you formally differentiate with respect to X. And then uh, you get that this map is actually the unique entropy solution to this guy. Since, as I mentioned uh, before, we do not have uniqueness of the Hamiltonian, then the neural network also compute the entropy solution for other kind of a conservation law where you replace H by H tilde, and now you take the gradient and then you arrive with that kind of conditions. So it's any H tilde that takes the same value as HP when you evaluate that uh, PI plus a constant. Here I consider again another variation of um, the same architecture when the maximum is replaced by a smooth maximum. So, Instead of uh, the max, we consider a soft version of the max that can be written uh, like this. So it's uh, the approximation of the maximum using epsilon log logarithm, the sum of the exponential uh, of your element of uh, epsilon. So we can further specialize the architecture where we force the parameters to be minus one half of the PI. So now I enforce here the new one to compute the scalar product of the input X with the PI, and then the theta I needs to be of the form uh, of minus one half the PI L to square. And then I have um, the bias. So when I do this, then this neural network defines the following function. And what you can show easily, this is only a matter of a few lines of a calculus, is that the neural network that you define actually solves uh, that kind of uh, viscous Hamilton Jacobi PDEs. So you have the partial derivative with respect to time, you have the quadratic term, um, the kinetic uh, energy, where you have a minus and the Laplacian. Now, the thing here in that the initial data is uh, funny because it's given uh, by the following formula. So in practice, it's, this architecture does, uh, is not very useful or it's not useful at all for applications because if you give me an initial data, then uh, it is extremely hard to know if your initial data can be represented this way. And most probably it will not uh, be able, uh, I mean, that representation will not exist. So this is just out of curiosity, uh, what happens when we change the max pooling by the soft version, and this is what we get. And this is also straightforward uh, to see that when epsilon goes to zero, then uh, the solution that you define here actually corresponds to um, the first architecture when the smooth approximation of the maximum become the maximum. So this is very uh, straightforward and not that useful, but I'd like to mention that result because uh, to understand the effect of the max pooling operator, then it may be useful to understand better what's going on for these guys. So I'd like to mention uh, here uh, a bit of the summary of uh, what happened uh, so far. So far, we have exhibited a class of neural network architecture that can represent the viscosity solution of certain Hamilton-Jacobi PDEs where the Hamiltonian and the initial data are given by the parameters of the network. I wish to insist that this neural network defines Hamilton, uh, Hamiltonians and initial data that take a very particular form. So if the Hamilton-Jacobi that you want to solve take this particular form for the initial data in Hamiltonian, then you end business. Otherwise, you have only an approximation. So as I mentioned uh, before, all uh, the initial data and the Hamiltonians are actually given by the parameters of the network. 
So it may help uh, to understand what those building blocks, uh, the design of a neural network architecture, especially for deep neural network, uh, uh, do by understanding uh, more what's going on uh, with the solution of the Hamilton Jacobi PDs. So natural question is, can we uh, get other kind of architectures that can represent viscosity solution of other Hamilton Jacobi PDEs. So this is what I want to briefly mention uh, here. So we can consider this simple Hamilton Jacobi PDE when the Hamiltonian H is convex and depends only on the momentum. And you give me an initial data. So here we're going to assume that H is um, convex. And it is well known that uh, under some uh, technical assumption that the solution of this guy can be represented uh, using the lax olenic uh, formula. So essentially what you do is an infimal convolution between your initial data and T times the functional transform of H, which uh, we call the Lagrangian, evaluated at some uh, velocities, X minus U, where U is where you started. So you can write, it uh, this way too. So we here we're going to briefly um, uh, introduce uh, two new one uh, network architectures that will actually implement the uh, lax olenic formula and the parameters will give you again uh, the Hamiltonian or the initial data. So let me start with one architecture. So this time, uh, I mean, as before, the input of the neural network, again, X and T, where you want to evaluate the solution. Then I introduce some parameters, UI, and you compute the empirical velocity, X minus UI, where you started, of a T. So those guys are some uh, empirical velocities. Then, uh, so those guys should be considered as a neuron. Then uh, you, for each neuron, you send the result to an activation function that we call L, the Lagrangian. So you get L evaluated at the empirical velocities, and you do that m times. And now what you do is you take those guys and you multiply by uh, T, this guy, plus uh, AI. So you do an affine combination of your output. And finally, you consider the mean pooling. So you look at all those guys and you select the minimum. That defines a function that I call F1 of xt that reads exactly like this. So it is very reminiscent of the lax formula. And now we're going to have conditions uh, so that F1 actually is a up formula for the PDE. So this is what we have. So if you say L, the activation function that I see as the Lagrangian uh, is uh, convex and uniformly uh, Lipschitz, then the neural network define, I mean, is the up, uh, the lax olenic solution for the initial data uh, J, where you put T equals zero here. And the convex Hamiltonian is given by the functional transform of uh, the Lagrangian. And then you get, and that F1 is a viscosity solution to the associated Hamilton Jacobi uh, PD. So, again, you, this is simply uh, an example where you set, for instance, the dimension uh, to be 10. Then you give me, uh, then we uh, consider Lagrangian, compute the Fenchel transform, and then you can cook up some parameters, the network, so that you get exactly, uh, so that you define the neural network, it defines a function, and then you you get the, um, the viscosity solution following uh, of the associated hamilton jacobi PDs. So for this example, this is what you get. So these are a bunch of a minimum of quadratic at t equals zero, and then you let uh, t evolves in time, and this is the kind of solution that you get. Again, to implement this new one network, then it's only a few lines in TensorFlow uh, in um, PyTorch. 
there is another natural uh, uh, natural um, architecture for considering up-flex representation, where this time the parameters of the network are not the initial location, but are the velocities. So you give me a bunch of m velocities. As I was mentioning, so there is a second kind of architecture for, uh, that is inspired by uh, the uh, Maxolanic formula, where you give me a bunch of velocities v1 to vm, then you take the output of these uh, neurons and you feed the activation function J tilde, you get this guy, and then you do a fine combination. Finally, you take um, the mean pooling. So you define that kind of, uh, that new one uh, define that kind of functions. And under the assumption that there is a complex function little l, so that every time you evaluate little l, that you should see as a Lagrangian at the velocity vi, vi the other parameters, then uh, you can show that the neural network actually com um, compute a viscosity solution of the Hamilton Jacobi P when the initial data is given by your activation, activation function J tilde, and the Hamiltonian is given by the following formula that involves the parameters of the function. It's pretty much a similar result that, in the sense that the initial data and the Hamiltonians are given by the parameters and the activation function of the neural network. So I'd like to, ah, okay. I'd like to here to conclude and saying that we have uh, provided a new network architecture that can that represent viscosity solutions of certain Hamilton type of DPDs in potentially high dimension. So the Hamiltonian and the initial data are given the neural network either by the parameters of the network or by the activation function. And you can solve them if the Hamiltonian and the uh, uh, initial data take this particular form dictated by uh, the neural network. So um, we hope that Building blocks of uh, some of certain neural network uh, can be better understood by mapping these blocks to solution of the uh, of uh, PDEs. So, for instance, uh, Hamilton Jacobi PDEs, and uh, trying to get an understanding or interpretation of what those architectures or the blocks of architectures are doing. So we are currently uh, extending these uh, neural network uh, approaches for computing uh, viscosity solution of certain uh, Hamilton Jacobi uh, PDEs that arise when you want to compute um, optimal, when you want to solve optimal control of uh, certain linear ODEs. Then uh, uh, this work also seems to pave the way to combine uh, these neural networks with other standard approaches to mitigate or overcome the curse of dimensionality. Here I'd, uh, I'd like to mention that it seems natural to combine uh, these uh, neural network uh, architectures with a mean or max plus method to deal with more general uh, Hamiltonian and initial uh, data. I also have uh, an FPGA implementation, so it's actually more than underway. I have already some preliminary results, and we can talk offline, and I can give you some numbers related to that. So I should stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerome, uh, for the great talk. Uh, I guess we'll open the floor for questions. Oh, uh, I guess I had a question, Jerome. Yes, I see. Um, yeah, I was wondering, uh, so you're... You've implemented uh, this method specifically in mind for um, silicon chips that will make use of the neural network algorithms. Is that right? Well, I mean, the history is more like um, oh, okay. 
well, I mean, the history, I mean, the, my personal or original motivation was uh, more about trying to understand what certain uh, neural network architecture could do. And, uh, and so, so the thing is, uh, I, we realized that certain architecture actually would compute those uh, so solutions of uh, Hamilton Jacobi PDEs. And uh, it was originally as a way to trying to understand what those new network architecture are doing, right? Uh, it turns out that you can also use those uh, neural architecture for solving Hamilton Jacobi PDEs. Now, it depends on what you want to do. But again, I mean, so far, what we have uh, is works only for certain Hamilton Jacobi PDE where the Hamiltonian and the initial data take um, the very specific form given by the theorem. Oh, okay. Uh, right? Thank you so much, Jerome. Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't see the raised hands, but now I see them. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Okay, so first, I suppose uh, we'll have uh, Khalees, and I'll unmute you now. Okay. Go ahead, Khalees. Uh, hi, Jean. I, I have a question. I, mean, I understand the direction that you are going. So what, what you just said of, of having networks that would solve exactly a, a certain hamilton deco equations. Uh, do you have any idea on how to go in the other direction? So because here somehow you don't have an approximation viewpoint, no? Because either you have certain initial data and Hamiltonians that are matched exactly with the architecture or, or not, right? Yes, 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 yes. The initial data and the Hamiltonian must be, uh, I mean, must take a particular form so that it can be represented by uh, the neural network. And is there any way that one could improve on that to to actually use this to approximate a, a, a given hamilton jaco equation, which is not exactly the one that you have in mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, as of today, I mean, uh, with uh, Ting Wen and Gabriel, we're actually pushing for exact representation and not for the approximation. But this is definitely one way to go. And also, I'd like to mention that uh, the parameters of the ne neural network can be changed online. Okay. So, so that's very easy to do. Uh, I mean, uh, even for when you implement on an FPGA, it takes a few nanoseconds to change the parameters and we do the evaluations. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I understand. I, I can imagine that, for instance, if you think about control problems where the control variable lives in a discrete space instead of a continuous space, that can also be linked to what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, cool. And I think we have, we'll go for one more question and then we'll head to the breakout room. Uh, I guess Krenner, uh, I'll uh, unmute you. Uh, please, Krenner. Hello. Hello. Very okay. Nice work. Um, beautiful work. But uh, from an engineering point of view, the main reason to solve Hamilton Jacobi equations is to prove stability of dynamics. Do you have any dynamics associated with your equations uh, that you can prove uh, stability using Lyapunov methods? Yeah. Um, so as of today, no, but I am in contact with uh, Karl Brunner uh, and he has some ideas about that. So me, no, but uh, Karl Brunner has some ideas. And uh, so as of today, uh, no. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Um, I guess it's time right now, so... Uh, we we'll go technically to... have until 11.30, so I think we can okay. take the rest of the questions. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so please, does anyone have any raised hands? Okay. Uh, Levon, I'll unmute you. <clears throat> um, please, Levon. Okay. Uh, can you go back and show me the slide for A2, Jerome? I just want to see how... Restricted is that assumption. Uh, so let me go back. Um, okay, let me be clear. Uh -huh. That guy, that guy, will uh, be related to the initial data. 
Okay. I see. Initial data, then those neural network architectures are based on the op formula. For the op formula, you need uh, the initial data to be convex. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Okay, so so the data that you are given is so this pi both phase pi's and gamma's are given, and then you want the existence of a convex function that interpolates gamma exactly those uh, points. Because those neural network are based on the representation on uh, of up formula for which you need to have the initial data to be convex. Okay. Okay. That's why that, uh, mm -hmm. assumption is crucial here. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, to to kind of get a feeling how restrictive is that, and uh, if you have, let's say, uh, pi's and gamma. Basically, if you have uh, this uh, discrete set in the in a graph, uh, mm -hmm. how would you uh, how would you check or how how, how how would you check whether there is such a function or not or like how restricted is that? So that's what I want to do. Uh, actually, I mean, it's even more ret restrictive than uh, the up and lax formula. For up formula, so the main assumption that you ask is to have a convex uh, initial data. So how do you check even in the up formula that you have a convex function or not? Generally, you assume that you have a convex function. Right, that's right. And for the uh, lax or laning formulation, then you assume that the Hamiltonian is con convex. And again, uh, it's if you give me in general uh, some pi's and gamma i, and to check uh, that uh, you have existence of a convex function, you can do it using uh, optimization, but uh, it's not going to be an efficient optimization. Okay, okay. I thought there would be some kind of like. Um... May, uh, maybe the, the class of functions can be restricted and then we'll have to deal with some kind of cones or whatever, maybe some yeah. uh, this type of, I don't know. Okay, but I just wanted to make sure that I understand correctly the, uh, the conditions. So thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, all right, and I, I'll unmute Maurizio. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Maurizio, please. Hi. So... <laughs> As for the first part of the talk, uh, I understand the, uh, the relation between uh, any Jacobi equations and uh, conservation law allows you to pass from one side to the other side, considering the derivative with respect to x. But this is true only in dimension one. So yeah. in higher dimension, this will not be true. So I, that, that, that result will stay at dimension one. And if you want to apply the Hamilton uh, uh, to Hamilton Jacobi equation, the representation formula in higher dimension mm -hmm. using the off flux uh, or the formula, uh, then I, I think that there is a, another bottleneck. If you go back to the slide where you were describing the lax Solyanic formula, you see that there is the Legend transform. So yeah. in the case of the Hamiltonian that you have considered, the one where you have the norm of the gradient, then uh, H star uh, is, is rather simple. There are other cases where you can explicitly write the um, Legend transform, for example, the quadratic case. But there are not so many Hamiltonian having a, a very easy to go H star. So we need another method to compute the H star. There is an algorithm that works in dimension two, perhaps, I don't know if they extended this to dimension three, uh, is the Brignier and Correa's algorithm, that is the fast Legend transform, but for higher dimension, I don't know how to do that. I totally agree with you. So it's pretty similar that when we, uh, let me put it this way, when you are using optimization techniques for solving the optimization problem associated to um, up formula or the laxolenic formula, then we assume that you have uh, at least the representation of this guy given explicitly and also the gradient most of the time. Okay. 
So I agree with you that, uh, but this is also, let me be clear. In optimization, the way it is done generally, we have to compute the proximal point of uh, functions. And we assume in optimization that computing the proximal point is very uh, easy and known. And we have only uh, a few of them. So mm -hmm. the restriction applies here. If you give me a general convex function, then computing the central transform is hard. And I agree with you that it works in 1D, 2D. I remember some students of Grenier did that in 2D and 3D, then it takes forever. So if, okay. if we do not have uh, those representation, then uh, it means we can use this uh, architecture. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, and then thank you. And then uh, we have the next questions by Wu Chen. I'll unmute you. And Wu Chen, please. Uh, hi, Dr. Bao. This is a very, very interesting talk. I like it a lot. So I have a question. Have you considered like using this for optimal transport or um, your games? So because when, recently we just computed very similar stuff. We we need to parameterize the solution of Hamilton Jacobi equation. And I don't remember like which exactly formula we use, but it seems like you have a very canonical way to approximate the... Well, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So the answer is no, we didn't do it. And uh, mm -hmm. one of the key thing uh, here is, again, the Hamiltonian are very simple in the sense that they depend only on uh, the momentum. Now, if you want to introduce a dependence in space, as it uh -huh. happens in mean-field game, then this is a different difference. Well, you can take the optimal transfer at the beginning. Optimal transfer, let's say, Hamiltonian, just like P2 power 1 or P2 power 2. So this is exactly this setting. Yeah. We didn't do it. Okay. Well, that's the only, because so far, Alex, I think you, I mean, what, what is your, your approximation of phi? I mean, the hamilton jacobi equation. I, I don't remember. It's not like this, right? Oh, uh, it's, yeah, it's just um, a fully connected network. Yeah, you yeah. just write yeah something depend on t and the x. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's no special structure to it. Yeah, yeah. I would like to see. I mean, I, I think there's a lot. Of, if you can solve it exactly, so maybe you find a very nice way to solve the open transport using this network. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think we have uh, time to squeeze in one more question by uh, Massey. So I'll uh, unmute you, Massey. Please yes. go ahead. Hi. So actually. I just have one question. I don't understand how you choose the number of neurons m, and maybe how it scales with the property of the Hamiltonian and the dimension of the problem. Uh, it's more uh, here um, we were trying to understand at first. You give me such a neural network architecture, and um, it defines a function, and then uh, then it says, well, this is the Hamilton Jacobi PDE that you solve. So it does not work uh, the way it is presented here. It's not like how I choose M. It's you are given this architecture with this assumption of the parameters, and this is exactly what the neural net is doing. Now, uh, if, you, if you give me an initial data, J and H, mm -hmm. then this is a different business. Because you say, well, now, this is this architecture powerful enough to represent J and H? Mm -hmm. and you have some uh, hard constraints, right? No, it makes sense. Thank you so much. You have two kinds of questions every single time. So here we were focusing on trying to understand what's going on when the pi and theta and gamma I and m are given. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for all the questions. And uh, now we'll go ahead and take a break, and the next talk will be at 12 o'clock. <laughs>